Okay, so time for the first session, for the love of academic writing. And uh, as you see from the program, and as has been already been announced, we're going to have two speakers today with this session. The first is going to be Professor Jane Cowan, and then the second one, Professor Devo Teivainen. And if you pay close attention to the program, you'll see that we have ample time. We're going to be with this session until noon, which means that you're going to have a very rare, wonderful opportunity to engage with our speakers. And of course, we realize that it's the first session. You're going to be all intimidated and no one is going to say anything. And that's why I will also take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions myself. However, in all seriousness, I do hope and we all do hope that you will join in. This is for you, even though we really, of course, enjoy being here up front and talking to you. Seriously, this Windsor School is for you. The first speaker, I warned Devo that I'm going to be a bit um, unfair and unbalanced in my presentations because Jane Cowan is someone that I'm extremely happy to present with this session. Um, thinking of the fact that Jane is here this year actually inspired the very theme, the very name of this session for the love of academic writing. Because Jane is someone who embodies that. And um, she is one, I'm sorry to almost say this, of a few scholars whose texts are worth reading just for the text itself. And what's remarkable about Jane's writing is that sometimes you will have people who will resort not to gimmicks, I don't mean to say that in a diminishing way, but to something extraordinary and striking, which makes you pay attention to their writing. They will use sort of experimental narratives and all that is wonderful. However, what I find particularly inspiring about Jane's work is that you can't detect anything such in her writing. There are no gimmicks. Rather, the text itself is so polished that it will engage you and it will make you want to stay with it and read it till the end. Now, um, I trust that you all know what I'm talking about. We don't see as many academic texts that actually have this quality. And this is the reason why it is such a great pleasure to have Jane here. And um, you know this because we are in collaboration and I'm very privileged by it because of that. But I want to say it again, that you are one of the, bo the biggest, if not the biggest, influence on my own writing as well. And I feel like reading Jane's work has been instrumental for me in a period when I felt like I was really trying to transition from someone who knew how to go with the flow and go through the motions in a way to really finding my own voice. So that's why I'm extremely happy to do this. And it's a special day because it's your birthday. It is, yes. And I only know this because of Facebook. And um, I want us to sing also because Jane sings and she's in a choir. So let's go. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jane. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mia. Thank you for that happy birthday song. Uh, I'm very touched uh, and uh, very touched by your very kind and generous accolades. Um, so it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm having a fantastic uh, year as the um, ERCO professor at the Collegium and have the opportunity to get to know so many wonderful colleagues uh, and now you. So. I want to spend this time that I've got to speak um, to say some things about my relationship with writing. And um, I will get very close and personal, as you can see. And, uh, but I think this is important to kind of understand the, the, deep, the deep wells, let's say, uh, of our creativity as writers. So let me start with a story about an invitation uh, to go to Turkey this autumn, uh, the first of several stories that I'll, that I'll tell you. Um, so I was invited by a former, um, by a young Turkish scholar who's dissertation whose doctoral thesis I had examined about 12 years ago. And she had organized a conference in Turkey uh, for 
primarily anthropology uh, doctoral students and a few postdocs. Uh, I don't know if how many of you have followed the news in Turkey in the last couple of years, but um, academics, among others, are having a very tough time. Um, and about two and a half, two years ago, two, three years ago, uh, a number of academics signed a petition asking the Turkish government uh, to refrain from violence in its dealings with the Kurds, because this was a moment when the, the very ongoing violence uh, between uh, the, the Kurdish uh, PKK uh, and the, the, the Turkish government uh, meant that there was quite a lot of repression and violence uh, happening by the Turkish army toward, toward Kurds. And the people who had signed that letter, the academics who had signed that letter, uh, which was called the peace petition, many of them uh, the consequences for many of them was that they lost their jobs, some lost their passports, which meant that some who were uh, living outside of uh, Turkey cannot now go back. So this has had you know, huge kinds of uh, repercussions, both for those academics, but also for PhD students. Um, certain universities were actually closed down, also some departments were closed down. And I uh, parenthetically want to say it isn't just academics, but it was also journalists, NGOs, judges, people in the public sector, anybody who was really taking a position uh, against what the government was doing uh, was likely to face repression. And this is still ongoing. So this conference was organized um, in part for us to be able to show a kind of solidarity with our Turkish colleagues. And uh, it was a three-day conference in Istanbul. The first day was a symposium of uh, Turkish academics, uh, but also publishers, who were talking on the theme of what's it like to write and publish uh, in Turkey under conditions uh, such as these. Um, and it was also looked at in a historical context because this is not the first moment when the government has been quite uh, repressive toward um, scholars and academics. So in the 1980s, you also had a kind of simil similar uh, situation. Uh, and so we had uh, academics across the range of age from quite you know, young scholars and some in the audience, so, some, some who were speaking uh, had themselves uh, lost their passport and or lost their job. But we also had some people in their 50s and 60s who had been involved at earlier moments uh, in this, um, let's say, struggle uh, against the Turkish government. Uh, and in fact, uh, the interpreters who worked with us were themselves individuals who were academics who lost their jobs in that earlier period uh, in the 80s and had had to get work for the rest of their lives as interpreters between Turkish and English or French. Okay, So it was a really, really interesting uh, and very moving and very inspiring and very humbling uh, experience. Um, now, the second two days were devoted to the, the work of these uh, mostly doctoral students who were in the course of writing their uh, doctoral theses, but n a number of them had lost their supervisors okay, in these um, firings and the closings of departments and were being supervised by other people who might not have been specialists, who would have been overloaded with students. So in some sense, they were academic orphans. And the, what we were doing in the, in the, the second and third day was um, a, a group of about seven academics, four Turks, uh, an Austrian, a German, and, and me, an American, um, were reading, we read 12 uh, draft chapters, and we, went through one by one and commented uh, on them and gave them a kind of intensive feedback. Now, before we began that, um, the organizer, uh, Oslem, asked all of us who were uh, the academics sort of convening and chairing these and giving our own comments, she asked us to talk for 10 minutes about our 
writing biography, our relationship to writing. And I thought at the time this was a very odd and intriguing request. I'd never really thought about my relationship to writing. But in the course of these three days, which were very intense and very emotionally powerful and kind of created this sense of intimacy, I would say, and, 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 and trust between all the, the people who were participating, we heard extraordinary sort of writing biographies. And I think it was that experience that um, made me suggest to Mia and, and Kaisa and uh, Sandari that we might kind of think about uh, asking you to submit some writing biographies. But what you'll see now in the rest of my story uh, is that I've gone probably more up close and personal than you have in your biographies. But uh, there are, uh, there's a reason why uh, I'm doing that, because I hope that I can kind of convey some of the reasons that writing for me is both a great pleasure and joy and also, you know, something really terrible and awful at the same time. So uh, I, like many, I think, have a love-hate relationship to writing. I think this is a very common thing, uh, but I want to talk to you about some of the reasons. When did we start? When did I start? Uh, I'm just thinking about my time. Don't worry. Okay. I've taken about 10 minutes. That's all right. Okay. So. So it was, so what I'm going to actually talk you through is kind of a little bit of an elaboration of um, the, 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 the writing biography that I gave in Istanbul. I hope I'll be able to read my notes. Um, but I started, and I start today, um, with the fact that I have always, as far as I can remember, been a bookworm someone who loved to read. So this is my sister, who's one and a half, peeking out from the crib, and that's me at uh, age three, <coughs> sitting at a little table very seriously, um, reading, I can see it's a kind of uh, workbook, probably, uh, you know, like you would get in primary school. So at a very, very early age, I turned to uh, to reading. Now, why is that? I, I can remember that this has just been something that I uh, have loved for a very long time, is to read. Uh, and in doing this, I want to emphasize the relationship between reading and writing. Um, and I, it, it took uh, a period, actually, in kind of psychotherapy, which began to kind of help me understand what that was about. And I think uh, what we figured out, I and my therapist, was that uh, I had a very strong relationship with my mother. And then at the age of uh, 17 months, this bubbly, dynamic, you know, attention-demanding little sister arrives, and suddenly my relationship with my mother is, is broken in a way. I don't have her kind of full attention in the way that um, a first <coughs> baby, a first child does. And I think I waited patiently for a while for my mother's attention to return to me, but I waited and I waited and, you know, she did what she could, but, you know, a, a, a mother with a new baby is very busy. And little by little, I realized I had to um, find another sort of stimulation and attention, and I turned to books. And um, I read voraciously. I wasn't pressured to learn how to read. I think it was something I wanted to do myself, and little by little uh, I, I learned. And my mother uh, is an English teacher, so I think she was actually thrilled that uh, I was moved to read um, literature. So that was the beginning, that, that reading was a pleasure. I had this sort of uh, great, voracious appetite for all kinds uh, of reading. Um, and I think it was not only the things that I was learning about the world, but also the, the pleasure of words, their rhythms, their cadences, their associations, their colors, 
their tempos, all of that, language itself, as well as what language conveyed, were the things that kind of thrilled me. So I grew up um, quite solidary in a certain kind of way, uh, in which I needed a lot of time for my own, uh, my own thinking. Um, one of the interesting aspects of this relationship is I think that what you see here is that my sister is looking, to, sort of looking out and probably waiting for me to notice her. And of course, I'm stuck in a book. And I think that this perhaps kind of characterizes our relationship over a long period of time. Uh, so it's interesting what um, happens um, uh, in early life um, through the reading kind of relationship. But anyway, um, as the daughter of an English teacher, I um, <coughs> began not only to, to read a lot, or I, or I continued to read a lot, but I also um, started writing. And I realized, uh, I, I, I wrote kind of creative writing and poetry when I was in high school. It's not something I do anymore in that kind of genre, but I, I appreciate the importance of writing in a way that grabs and keeps the attention of the reader. But perhaps more importantly for me, um, I think writing is thinking. Writing is the way that I try to figure out something and try to figure out how I think about it. Try to figure out what I think is going on. And then, once I figured out what's going on, how do I communicate that in a clear way to my readers? So it is both about helping me understand something and then trying to tell my readers uh, what I think is going on. So if we move to the kind of academic writing, um, path, journey. Um, so my, my doctoral thesis was um, quite quickly turned into a book. Um, I forgot to make a slide of it, but I brought my copy, which maybe is even better. So anybody who wants to look at it, maybe I'll pass it around. But this is the book uh, that came out of the doctoral work in Northern Greece. Uh, it's called Dance in the Body Politic. Uh, in Northern Greece, and it was published by Princeton University Press in 1990. Um, and I'll say some more about it when I talk about um, issues of voice, but perhaps I'll just pass that around for whoever wants to see it. And I think in the sense that writing for me is thinking, that writing has often been about trying to explore questions. So I think we can, can we move it to the next one? Yeah. So questions have been important, even though it's often taken me a long time to figure out what is the question that I'm asking and wanting to know about. So. I would say that the dance in the, poly, uh, da dance in the body politic question uh, was something like, how do unequal relations of gender, how do gender inequalities, how are they produced and reproduced through pleasurable practices of celebration, dancing, sociability? How is something, in a sense, iniquitous and damaging produced through situations of joy and attachment and, and things that we value. So this was um, a question that um, animated me as a feminist as well as an anthropologist in the 70s uh, and early 80s when I was doing my doctoral work because I am a, of the generation of the second wave of feminism. And I think writing from, from puzzles, from questions, has been something that I have 
I have often done. I didn't realize that until I began, until I was asked to write this writing biography. But I noticed that um, some of the papers that I've written um, pose a question. So the first one, 203, who's afraid of violent language? So this was the first article that I published out of the research that I uh, began at the League of Nations archives relating to claims uh, for Macedonia or in order to get protection for Macedonian minorities um, in uh, Yugoslavia and Greece. And I, I was really, you know, I'd really encountered this, this um, question because I found that petitions had to fulfill five requirements uh, if they were to be treated uh, officially uh, by the Secretariat and by the League of Nations Minority Supervision System, and one of them was that they couldn't be phrased in violent language. And I didn't know what the hell violent language was, what did it mean, what was it about, why was this a condition of petition? So really, it was a, it was a true uh, intellectual question which was driving um, this. Although it wasn't one that I came in with, it was one that developed through my engagement with the empirical material. Um, another uh, question that kind of emerged um, is kind of phrased in the second paper, the success of failure. Um, and, and in this case, uh, what I was thinking about was how come if that fifth condition of receivability says you can't have repeat petitions. A petition won't be considered if you have another one of the same kind or the same issue uh, already in the system. And yet what I found was that uh, different political groups were sending in you know, petitions over and over again, repetitively, that were virtually the same or exactly the same. So what was going on? And what I kind of pose here as a question, um, is there, are these petitions actually really failing, or is there some kind of way in which they are successful even when they fail, or it may be because they fail? Okay, so a question is really driving uh, some of these papers. And then the third one is interesting because uh, here I was trying to look at it, uh, as I call it, a genealogy of international oversight of rights, trying to, as somebody who has worked with the contemporary human rights system, um, going to the League of Nations where they are dealing not with human rights but with uh, rights of minorities. Um, and noticing that the contemporary system really can be looked at and understood as a kind of system of audit Okay, where the international system is auditing the work of states, seeing whether they are properly uh, protecting and promoting the human rights of their people or not. Okay, and I had been looking at something called the Universal Periodic Review at the UN. Um, so that was very definitely, I think, something that could be understood as a kind of public audit uh, ritual. Could the League uh, system of, of supervising minorities treaties be understood also as an audit culture, uh, an audit culture, an audit, audit system. So, in fact, the the manuscript poses it as a question before audit culture dot, and also towards a genealogy of international oversight of rights. But interestingly, somewhere along the production process, the question mark uh, and towards got dropped, and I didn't notice it, either by the editor, who was a kind of um, strong and very clear German colleague, and I think maybe she didn't like the ambiguity, or by the publisher, I don't know which, but anyway, that got dropped out. So I think that's kind of an interesting case of where you have to kind of keep your eye on the ball when you have uh, your, your texts um, going through the publishing process. Uh, and I'll just give you one final uh, example of that. Uh, which I haven't put up here because it's, um, it, it's still being written. Uh, and that is, a, is a, a paper I'm writing now 
uh, about the universal periodic review process uh, in which I noticed when Greece was being reviewed in, in 2010, kind of in the, in the beginning, but nonetheless well-established throes of the financial crisis, the issue of the financial crisis and its consequences for human rights and their violation or their lack of fulfillment was hardly mentioned at all by the different individual states who made recommendations and comments. And so my question is, how do you explain that invisibility of the financial crisis in this first universal periodic review of Greece? Now, I'm still trying to figure out what that was about or make a kind of argument about it. But anyway, you can see how it's very important uh, for me uh, to be using the question as a kind of driver, a driving force uh, in, my, in my work. Okay. Um, I consider myself to be a very slow writer, and uh, at least a very slow writer of articles and books. Um, we all have our own sense of the tempo that we think we ought to fulfill. Um, it's true that I'm partly so because I'm actually doing so many other things, which also involve writing. So think about the different genres, the different kinds of writing that you are all involved in uh, on an everyday basis, and, and this does change through your life. But I'm writing emails, reports, peer reviews of uh, f people who are writing journal articles. Uh, I'm writing comments on my students and colleagues' uh, chapters, I'm writing applications, I'm writing reference letters. So actually, I'm writing, writing, writing all the time. But maybe I think, like Visa, I should be doing this, but I'm actually not. I should be, you know, I should be, I should be writing my book, but somehow it's really hard to get to that book because I'm doing quite a lot of other things. But it's also slow, a slow process for me because I need time to really ge gestate and cook. I, that material needs to cook. I mull over things, I read a lot, I think. So I think, I don't know whether I'm a good person to you know, follow in that, but just to tell you the reality of my own writing life is that I'm very slow. I also feel I'm not very good at structure. Uh, I get excited by too many different, you know, strands. I get lost in the trees. Um, it takes me time to find the problem, the question, um, but somehow I usually kind of get there. Um, I think one of the things that probably concerns you, but also what concerns me and probably uh, a lot of us as academics is how to figure out that relationship, which I think is a complicated relationship, between theory and the empirical. Okay, so I think for anthropologists this is a, an issue because we're very um, devoted to, uh, fascinated by, uh, the, the, the actual kind of empirical situation that we're, that we're looking at, um, but we are also very interested in theory, but how does one use theory, let's say, as, uh, uh, as an anthropologist uh, being very empirical, and those of you from other disciplines may recognize this, this uh, sort of uh, problem or dilemma um, as well. Um, I think the issue of voice, Oftentimes, students think um, that the problems that they face are some, you know, technical lack of knowledge about something or other. I find the most core issue uh, for students is actually finding the voice, uh, which is actually creating a voice, and that's really um, a, a kind of long time work. I was very lucky as a PhD student to be encouraged by my doctoral committee to write uh, my dissertation, as it was called in the US, 
um, as if it were a book. Uh, I was, I think I learned quite early on and was comfortable with writing in the first person. Um, to me, this is more um, epistemologically legitimate um, because I, I own my own point of view, my perspective. Uh, it's mine, it's not the voice from, from nowhere or the, the, the view from nowhere. Uh, everybody who writes is positioned historically, politically. We know all this in terms of gender, sexuality, nationality, religion, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this, I think, is now, um, certainly, I think, in the social sciences, something that we are, are very aware of. Um, So, so going back just to this question of how does an anthropologist engage in an empirical work use theory, and that question that I had that animated uh, the, the work on dance, um, how, does, uh, how do we as women uh, reproduce, contribute to reproducing the patriarchy? Um, that was, you know, that's uh, a version of the question uh, of, of, of the dance, of the dance book. And there, for example, when I began reading Antonio Gramsci on his work on hegemony and consent uh, and how consent is enlisted uh, by those who may suffer from what is being consented to, to me that was like a revelation and it really spoke to me. So can we go to the next one? Okay, I'm going to just finish up in the next few minutes. Um, you never know how your work resonates with others um, and how it acts on the world as people read and respond to it uh, and even incorporate it into their own work. And this can happen in very surprising ways. So. A couple of years ago, I got this letter from my friend Katarina, who is an anthropologist, and she said, Hi, Jane. Chronio pola. Happy New Year. I was reading a short Greek novel during the holidays, Choros Taputiria, Dancing on the Glasses, on the Little Glasses, and I came across you as a character in the book. I don't know if you're aware of it. Your name in the story is Cecilia Papadakis, and you are Swedish. And it turns out that I'm, you know, six foot tall, blonde, no, dark haired, that's it, dark haired, six foot, um, and there I am, a minor character, uh, nonetheless, in this novel, which has several quotations from my book, which was translated into Greek in 1998. Uh, and this has been incorporated as part of the, the sort of uh, narrative uh, in the book. And uh, uh, you know, properly cited, actually. But the maybe we can go to the link just for fun, so you can see the author. Now, I've never met. Um, yeah, if you go. Yeah, I've never met the author of this uh, dancing on the glasses, but there she is, and that's the cover of the book, Quaros Tapotiria, and it's. Um, it's a novel about uh, an immigrant, a, a Greek who ends up in Sweden uh, washing windows on high-rise buildings, who gets a letter from home and decides he has to go back and avenge the murder that, you know, the murder of somebody in his family actually during this, the Greek Civil War and then what happens between these two men. So it's a quite uh, uh, interesting Civil War story and uh, as, uh, as I remember, the um, anthropologist appears as the, essentially the confessor. Uh, one of the men talks to the anthropologist about why he did what he did and why the, the dancing, in fact, what happens is that there's a conflict over the dance. So one of them murders uh, him because of a conflict over the dance. So that's the relevance of the story. So I just um, wanted to end with this kind of funny and interesting and rather intriguing little story. I mean, I'm incredibly flattered uh, and very intrigued by, by this way in which uh, my, my work has gone into the world and somebody has decided to kind of use it in the context uh, of a novel. Uh, and so I, I leave you with that. Thank you very much.
trust that you also have things in mind. Let's move on to table now and uh, then continue with our discussion after. I said that my introduction is a bit unfair and imbalanced, uh, but it doesn't mean that there's no introduction. So Jane, thank you, I'll let you sit down. Devo um, is uh, a professor, like he said, here at the University of Helsinki. And uh, I do admit, Devo, that I don't know your writings that intimately. But what I do know is that he is a very inspiring person, both in his speaking and writing, and in great, great demand. If anyone follows his social media, one wonders how the man manages to be in so many different locations, speaking of so many different things. We are just reading Harry Potter with my, my younger son, and Hermione there, you may remember, if some of you have read it, she has this clock that she keeps on switching back and forth, which allows her to be in simultaneous locations at once, and we may want to ask if Theo has a similar thing. Um, you have written a number of books, and importantly also in Finnish for different audiences, scholarly audiences, and also books that I understand to be intended for a broader audience. So this is going to be a slightly different um, approach, I suppose, but what do I know? You're the one who's going to be speaking. So, yeah. Devo, please. Thank you. Um, for the inspiring introduction also. Oh. And also thank you for inviting me here for writing. This is one of the best places where I have been because for writing one of the things I appreciate is freedom. I don't know how it's with the current director here, but uh, when I was here, our director, when I started said like, now you have total freedom to do anything you want. We don't even expect you to do the things you said you would do when you applied to come here. And I was like, ooh, all this talk about working life getting worse and worse has been cancelled. And I've, I've been telling everybody this is a paradise. And I'm happy to see so many applications coming from different parts of the world. One thing I'm worried about, the one of the most attractive things about Collegium in the old times that one could tell people to really impress them that apart from all these things, free massage. <laughs> and I hear there's no more free massage. So um, um, that was uh, a detail that many people seem to um, appreciate quite, quite a lot. So after Jane's wonderful and inspiring uh, talk, mine will be perhaps more as footnotes and scattered ideas on what writing is and this sort of love and as she correctly put it, love-hate relationship or frustrations also about writing because it's a lot about frustrations. For me also one of these things, I don't know how many shared this, is to have this, some might call it 80% syndrome or something. You're so excited about writing something then you get to the let's say more or less 80% or even 90% of it's done, and then you're like, I'm sort of done it. And then a long time later, you realize it's still there. And, and this is one of my biggest personal frustrations of um, how to get over, over that. And, and I throw it here as a question, uh, because in some sense, uh, writing and academic conversation is about questions. I've been quite inspired by the Zapatista sort of uh, walking metaphor of asking questions we walk. Preguntando caminamos. And, 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 and sort of I see academic conversation like people are walking there. <coughs> There's a conversation going on. You join it. You ask questions. Maybe you throw in some of your possible answers to some of the questions you leave. And the, academic conversation, the academic walk continues. And that's how you, you ended there. And then comes this uh, question, uh, like Mia was saying, I, I speak perhaps too much in, in like different things. And, and, and I keep them quite separate. I often, as you see, I'm powerless and pointless. I have no text here. And for me, speaking and writing are kind of different things. And this is one source of frustration going around and speaking and, and having that as one world and then writing as another world in terms of productivity, in terms of making most out of it. It's sometimes 
frustrating, and I've been trying to think about different ways to integrate speech and writing in, in uh, uh, more efficient ways. I actually have some hopes. I'm normally not seen as a sort of techno-oriented person, though I will reveal today that perhaps I am, but this sort of speech recognition technology is actually probably going to change possibilities of writing. I quite <laughs> admire, for example, there's a Finnish historian who says, was very productive and he produces supposedly, at least he claims his books when walking his dog and, 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 and just, you know, uh, dictating the, the book to a, to a machine. And uh, maybe there's a person somewhere doing the, doing the work of uh, make, transforming it into text. But more and more we're getting closer to this, that you can speak and then the al algorithms put it uh, as a text. And, and at least for somebody like me, I think it's, it's uh, a, something that might change, maybe not for my generation so much. But this idea of either sitting in a nice terrace, warm outside, beautiful, dark, nice light, and you sit and you write. But also this thing that you could walk in a park and, and just dictate and produce text that way is going to be more possible. And I believe it might change and is already changing some of the um, uh, sort of the difference, the distance between speech and writing. Um, and since in this conversation, like Jane was saying, reading is important, listening is important. Sometimes the speech and writing for me, for example, when I try to understand people who uh, might be quite complicated, like, for example, uh, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, who uh, uh, some of you might be aware of her work, who writes in a very, very, very complicated way. And then it's really wonderful to see in YouTube her videos where she speaks about the same stuff. And it's like two different worlds. And you really get to understand stuff, complicated, opaque stuff that she writes about, and then listening to her words so they can be uh, uh, one can uh, make use of the interaction between speech and writing. But I think technological change might mean that they will uh, become more integrated in the future. So what is this object that we love when we, we, we love writing? And, and now the and I was making the distinction between writing and speech, which might be uh, getting shorter the distance but academic writing in, in general. For me, I, I like many kinds of writing, and in that sense, the love can be seen as a sort of polyamorous relationship with different kinds of writing. For me, uh, the genres, and, and genres are always, categorization of genres is also always kind of subjective and all that, but let's say uh, journalistic writing, artistic writing, and then this thing, Jane was mentioning, these kind of different things that you write, so I'll just put it tweeting uh, as three categories of writing that I um, sometimes get inspired by. So journalistic writing, I've been working as a journalist and, and intend to continue perhaps doing that. And in um, some people in our field see it as a pejorative thing. Oh, that's kind of journalistic approach and that's not academic, that's journalistic. And, and there's some, uh, there are of course different levels of abstraction and all that, but I do believe uh, that many of the basic principles in journalistic writing and academic writing are actually very close to each other. Each other, the relationship to truthfulness, the sort of uh, uh, Logic of argumentation can be slightly different, but basically I see them as actually very, very close to each other. Um, and, and, of, and I believe sometimes academics could learn from journalistic way of writing in, in terms of clarity and um, argumentation. One issue in the sort of uh, journalistic and academic writing and their parallels is, uh, Jane was talking about Turkey and the difficulties in for freedom of expression there, which is, uh, of course, a situation very different from situation in places like Finland. I've been spending quite a lot of time in Latin America where there are specific contexts also that have to do with authoritarian threats to freedom of speech. 
but even in, in places like Finland, when writing about some things, for example, I've been, I sometimes deal with things like, okay, now I will write about, uh, about possibility that local police has committed racist crimes. Okay, assume I will write about that. I've written something related to that and I might write something more related to that. Then we come to the situation, if I write about that, suppose I have some <coughs> sources somewhere. Uh, am I, is my writing protected? Because if I write about that, you know, for example, that the police has a racist campaign that's violating laws and, and I have sources, they will get very interested in where did I get that information. And I've been, for example, asking lawyers of my union and everywhere, if that is the situation, am I protected? Can they force me to reveal my sources? We know of journalism that there's this protection of your sources and it's a very, um, sort of supposedly highly valued or widely known principle that you can protect your sources even though even in Finland that that principle is sometimes uh, not as uh, clearly protected as one might think in a country that claims to be a sort of freedom of speech, freedom of expression champion. But for academics, it's, uh, it's, it's more complicated. It's not so much known. So that's one area where the parallel between journalists and academics is interesting and that I've been trying to explore to what extent is my speech and my writing protected. For example, in the sense that under no circumstances I should be forced to reveal my sources. So this is um, there where I think learning from journalistic writing can be, can be interesting. Then I, then I think this sort of artistic writing or, or, or writing as art, like there are many, many things, of course, about that. I have this frust um, frustration that I always think when I'm uh, old then I want to be a poet and then I'm like, oh, well, maybe I just like to go to bar with poets and that's <laughs> it, but, uh, but in, in any case, that's, that's sort of my, my thing, but to what extent think about writing as an artistic creation and, and thinking about the institutional memory, somebody, uh, the person who was here inaugurating the ERCO chair, the first ERCO chair in Collegium, Stephen Gill, a uh, long time ago before he was ERCO chair. I remember I was chatting with him in Toronto and uh, he, he was talking about, he was fascinated by this thing how writing, creating academic articles should be seen as sculpture. We didn't go that much deeper, but I remember that. And then I've been thinking about it. Yes, there's of course this three dimensionality. Can you see the uh, thing that you writing or crafting as somehow three dimensional? I don't know so much about the three dimensionality there, though maybe it helps to people might have different ways of visualizing internally the text. Like, can you visualize it that's somehow three dimensional? But I think for example, this about crafting an article, this sort of difference between whether you are sort of building it like piece by piece, the article, or you carving it. Like you have this huge thing and then you start carving it. And the article, you start polishing the article, you start working on a huge kind of thing, or whether you create the sculpture sort of piece by piece and you don't need that much carving and people have different approaches and styles to writing and it might be helpful sometimes to think about whether the sort of carving or building the sculpture that is the text is the method that uh, suits you um, best. I sometimes to inspire myself I have this little uh, carving sculpture from Cuba in the early 1990s which is this wooden little carving, it has a couple sort of, I don't know, making love or something uh, or hugging each other or something in between, or both probably, and, uh, but it, then it's also like a gun. And the idea of the artist in Cuba was that it expressed both love but also oppression and violence against artistic freedom in Cuba 
at that time and by the regime in Cuba. And I have it, I've had it in, in the place where I'm writing, which sort of helps me think about how there are different, I don't believe in dialectics that much, I mean that's but, but sort of differences and different aspects in the same thing and to see the sort of love and violence in the same object. And in that sense, inspired by art can also be not only the fact of seeing the piece you're writing as a piece of art, but also how you are inspired by, uh, by art can be uh, interesting in writing. In Peru, where I lived for many years, we often had a, when we had an <laughs> academic conference, we would have an artist there, and the artist was not there to entertain us, but the artist was there to talk about creation in his work and to inspire us because as academics and sometimes as academics and activists, we, 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 we were thinking like um, sort of another world uh, is possible only if we are creative. And in order to be creative in the act of academic writing or in the act of sort of changing the world through some means, uh, insp being inspired by artists was something we were exploring quite a lot in, in, in Peru, I could. Uh, talk at some point more about that, but maybe not so much now. In Latin America also I've been inspired by the anthropophagic movement in Brazil of the 1920s and 1930s, the cannibalistic, uh, they were called the cannibalistic movement, where the idea about nationalism was like, instead of being sort of traditional anti-imperialists, it was like we cannibalize other cultures and we devour them, we eat them, and then we make our own creations out of the stuff we've eaten. And that kind of attitude, this conversation, academic conversation, I feel can sometimes be useful. You go there and you cannibalize uh, the stuff that you see in the academic conversation of texts and other conversation that's been going on, and then you make your uh, own, own, own creation. And this perhaps brings me maybe up, I don't know how long time I've been speaking, to thinking about this relationship of writing in the territory you love. And how, how, how is the, from where are you writing? And in sort of two, perhaps two, two different senses. One is the sort of disciplinary sense, because sometimes academic writing, the discipline, there's this, like whether you need discipline versus freedom is one, one of course, way of thinking about discipline. Sometimes I, for example, I found the Pomodoro system can be quite useful. I haven't been using it quite a lot. You probably know it might be right for 25 minutes and have a break of five minutes. And it sounds so simple and mundane, but actually it's, it's um, I know many people who benefited greatly from it. So it brings some self-discipline. But discipline in the other sense, how much are you inside your own academic discipline when you do academic writing and there's this huge debate of course on inter, trans, multidisciplinarity and all that and there's also some sort of, I have uh, colleagues who uh, started thinking like this interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary trend is also a threat to academic sort of standards and all that and, and, and so the, the uh, debate is quite complicated. So, so my, own, my own approach to this disciplinary thing is I sometimes try to see disciplines where, from where you write and the territory as territories in some sense. And as somebody who does world politics, uh, I make a parallel analogy between uh, nation states or territorial states as territories, as territorial units and academic disciplines as units. And then this sort of transnationalist Versus uh, a parallel to sort of transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, un unidisciplinary imperialism. You can have all kinds of things that are related to the place from where you write as an academic discipline. And I've been trying to explore there the concept of disciplinary cosmopolitanism in, in, in writing, which means both in, in sort of the real world, in nationalism, like being open to uh, learning from the other in the sense that it affects your own identity and in your own way of being, or in the uh, case of writing, your own style of and way of writing. And, and how to be, which doesn't necessarily mean that you become um, 
ruthless cosmopolitan in, in the sense that's a term by Stalin about Jews actually a long time ago, but uh, that you become uh, sort of, that you have to forget about your own discipline or you have to somehow reject your own discipline. Uh, but that you have this sort of cosmopolitan disciplinary attitude towards other, other disciplines and, and um, thereby uh, you, you change also um, across disciplinary boundaries. But the other way of thinking, and maybe I'll stop here about uh, sort of writing from territory you love is also um, writing in the language you love. And this is a huge question in Finland like when we're talking about belonging to langu linguistic groups that are quite small in the sort of global academic world. Whether I'm here perhaps assuming that for most of us, the language we most love is our first language or mother tongue or whatever the term is. And is it, it's not necessarily so. Sometimes, for example, I have with Spanish a very, I love speaking and writing in Spanish, for example, but still Finnish is my, my mother tongue, so I'm just assuming here. Being able to write in Finnish is being able to write in the language I love. And, and of course, it's become very difficult in a uh, context like the Finnish academic life, where we have this, that everything needs to be in English. And I sometimes believe there's uh, too much a fatalistic deterministic idea about if today everything is uh, much more in English than five years ago, five years ago, it was quite a lot more than 10 years before that, five years from now, there will be all the time more in Engli English. We have this uh, fear and almost like a fatalistic belief that Finnish will disappear as a language of higher education. And, and, and many people are bringing this up and Finnish will not disappear. It's quite big language actually in, 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 in many ways, uh, but uh, as a language of higher education and what that implies. So to come back to my, my newly discovered um, techno optimism, as an sort of old hippie, it's kind of funny to discover techno optimism. Um, but I've made this claim um, actually in a recent book that Google Translate will save Finnish language as, an academic, as a language of higher education. And uh, so I bring this as a question that I'll be happy to hear your comments about. Translation technology and algorithms are of course never perfect, but translation is never perfect, right? So, so often people when I, have a debate about this. People say it can never be, the algorithms will never be able to translate anything perfectly, nor will humans, right? So that's a basic thing about translation. Uh, my hypothesis is that, is it 10 years from now, 50 years <laughs> from now, 120 years from now? Will the world exist 120 years from now? I don't know. But if we think about translation technology, the algorithms, Google Translate being one commercial name for those, are uh, uh, 10 years past, even two years past, now it's changed quite a lot. Think about the next 20 years, the next 50 years. So I think it's clear whether it's with the help of human hand in the process, transforming something written in the language you most love into a language that those whom you want to read a translated version of it will become significantly easier. It will not become perfect, but it will become significantly easier. And at some point we might be in the moment when we, most of us will be able to write our stuff in the language we most love and people will read from their platforms, from their whatever is it, it is that people read or listen to the articles in the, in the future in the language they most love. And in this sense, translation technology opens new possibilities for being able to deepen the love of writing. That was my techno fix sort of conclusion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank
Thank you so much, Devo. Um, indeed, you're here already posed a question to you, but can I ask you to come up front? And uh, Jane as well. So what I'm hoping now is that we have 45 minutes and uh, we'd like to have a discussion. And I think maybe, can we get three chairs because of the live stream or are we gonna be suffering? I'd really like us to be able to sit there, okay? Do we need to take the microphone with us? For the purposes of the live stream? Yeah, we do you mind if I, if, I, if I come to the sun, to the side? You Would you mind going to the yeah, no problem. Thank you. Okay. So we're only bothering with the mics because of the live streaming. So actually, I failed to mention at the beginning that we are, of course, with our techno hype of the importance of scholarship, we are um, online as we speak. There's a live stream that is available and it will be uh, recorded for later viewing. And uh, if any of you want to share the happy news of the session that we are enjoying here, you can absolutely do so both via Facebook and Twitter. You'll find the handles there and some of us have already been active in doing this. So thank you so much, Jane and Devo. Two wonderful presentations, which I think could not set a more appropriate tenor for our shared three days. And what I particularly liked, as I kind of guessed, is that we have very different approaches, which I think combined um, offer a very, a very good overview of many of the issues that one will encounter when thinking of the academic writing process. Now, um, I want to encourage you to get involved. So if you already have questions in mind, um, do raise your hand, but I'm gonna give you a bit of a pause to gather up some of your courage and also to give you some more time to formulate those questions. And uh, rest assured, we will never laugh at your face. Even if you pose a really stupid question, we will wait until we go to our offices and then do it at that moment. So you can, we can relax on that. Uh, to give you some time, I want to pose a question myself to continue on what you have shared. And uh, it is a question in three parts, which are all interrelated, and um, they kind of take us back to the very personal connection that we have to our writing processes, which Jane wonderfully shared at the beginning, and I imagine that we go to the world again from that point. And uh, this three-part question addresses what you both out well, sort of highlighted also, the love of academic writing, the hate. It is a love-hate relationship often, but then also of ways in which you get over it. So the question that I want to pose in all simplicity is, why do you write? And I'm guessing it has to do with maybe the love, the pressure, and uh, a need, a nagging need. So why do you write? How do you struggle? What does the struggle feel like? What does it look like? And how do you get over it? And I leave it up to you to share either very concrete, practical pieces of advice or, or reflections, or then something more obscure of, you know, how do you get over it because life goes on, whatever. So this is the three-part three question. Why do you write? How do you suffer? And how do you get over it? So, Jane, do you want to start? Okay. Why do you write? How do you suffer? Um, how do you get it. over it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I may not answer it in a very logical or very kind of systematic way, but um, I think if the first thing I want to say is that there's, there's love and hate, and I think that hate is sometimes expressed through avoidance. I think there's a lot of avoidance that a lot of us who write do, like, oh, I'm just too busy and I can't get to my writing until I do these other five extremely urgent things and wash all the dishes and you know clean the house and whatever. Um, so that, that's, that's one thing that, that we do. Um, and I suppose the hate is also the frustration when we know we want to say something and we can't quite figure out what it is we want to say or get the words that, that will convey it. Um, why do we write? Um, I think, okay, I, the example I suppose I can give is my dance book, the first big project that I did. And there, I think it was a very passionate 
um, experience of, of being both a dancer and an observer of dance when I was 21, living in Greece for, the, for a year as a, an, a university exchange student. And that was, um, so all the issues that were going on on the dance floor were issues that were very real and important to me. So the, 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 they were issues of, of the performance of self, the performance of oneself as a woman, as a, as a sexual being, as um, someone who should be respected and someone who should be liked. Uh, and I was seeing all of those dynamics played out by all the people that I was watching in a context of huge sort of sensual intensity. So we're drinking, we're talking, it's very noisy. You're drinking wine, you're eating food. Uh, you're having you know, intense conversations with the people around the table. At the same time, you're watching what's going on on the dance floor. You have to get up yourself and, uh, uh, and dance and join in the dance. You can't avoid it, actually. And the Greeks have an expression, um, uh, if you're in the dance, you've got to dance. And that's a kind of metaphor that they have for once you've kind of entered into some kind of business, you can't just cop out. You've got to follow through. You've got to do it. You've got to. And to do it, you have to have a certain kind of not only knowledge of the steps, you have to have a a social knowledge. So I knew that it was about social knowledge. I knew it was also about power, social power, okay? Because there are, um, there are consequences to the dancing. You can enhance your reputation. You can be seen as a fantastic dancer, as somebody who kind of commands the space. Uh, but you can also, if you blow it, people are going to be gossiping about you. So all of this was sort of so live for me that um, I wanted to um, convey it to um, an English-speaking audience. I, I, I guess I conceptualized my, my audience initially as um, anthropologists and students of anthropology and people who were interested in contemporary Greece and who might be interested in these issues of embodiment uh, and, and, and dance. So I guess I was really passionate to to convey that experience and also to try to interpret it using the anthropological concepts that I had learned. Because it seemed to me that that scene on the dance floor did kind of help us to understand how these, as I said in my talk, you know, how these relations of inequality get reproduced in, in, in a context of great pleasure and joy and excitement. Uh, and, and how can they be resisted? And, and I did find that, that they could also uh, be resisted. So as you can see, even when I talk about it, I'm very, very excited. And it, it remains a very alive um, passion and, uh, you know, for me. Um, so I suppose that tells you, you know, why I wrote. I think when I was writing, I was suffering a lot. Um, and, I, and I had the opportunity in the last, uh, well, it wasn't actually the last six months of writing. But in, in the year that I came back from the field, I came back in March. And then from September of that year for the, the entire academic year, the first Part of that till Christmas, I was uh, at Indiana University where I did my PhD in ethnomusicology and anthropology. I heard there were some ethnomusicologists in the room. So uh, I relate to what you're doing. Uh, and, and I worked um, on my thesis, but also was doing some teaching. And then from uh, Christmas onward, I actually came with my um, fiance, became my husband, um, Charlie, to Wales. And I lived uh, with him in this house in the very cold climate uh, of South Wales and pretty much wrote uh, in, in great solitude um, and great anxiety and great concentration. And uh, every Sunday we would take a walk on the, the sea and he would ask me to tell me what my argument was. And I'd say, I don't know, I don't know what 
what my argument is. But, but you know, he would, so, so in a sense, um, for me, the writing was uh, a solitary activity, great, great suffering, but great um, immersion and, and, and fascination as well with a few friends who I could then talk to. So I think there are different ways in which we write. Sometimes it's very lonely. I think it's often very lonely. Uh, we do need other people to be sounding boards and, and um, uh, you know, kind of solidaristic and supportive. Um, so uh, that's what, what I would say. So that tells you a little bit about the, about the passion and the suffering uh, of writing. Thanks, Devo. Um, I don't know. Thank you. So, um, yeah, why do I? Right, well, there are many aspects, of course, and there are sort of career related aspects that might be different in once you are in the kind of more secure academic position. So, the pressure is different than when you are looking for higher positions. In or more permanent positions in academic life and all of that. But perhaps the, the more interesting thing uh, here is the relationship between uh, sort of clarifying the terms of the debate and then changing the world, yeah. kind of two dimensions. And I believe that for me clarifying the terms of the debate comes first, but it's not that I would claim it's neutral in terms of sort of changing the world kind of thing. I may have changed a little bit my, myself in uh, the way I see that relationship. So the sort of conceptual precision and, and in this, this sense sort of uh, clarifying the terms of the debate. Uh, let me give an example. For example, I write and I discuss every now and then and quite often the relationship between liberty derived terminology and property derived terminology and I sometimes argue that often when people talk about something with liberty derived words like that expresses liberal economic policy or neoliberal something or something I ask like if it really is about something where priority is to guarantee certain property relations, certain untouchability of certain kind of property arrangements, wouldn't it be analytically more meaningful to call those people proprietarian rather than libertarian or other liberty derived words? And, and my claim is often that analytically this makes sense. Of course, since these are very highly sort of uh, debated issues, it's difficult not to see that kind of terminological intervention as having a sort of political intentionality, which uh, there might be, but it's not as simple as that, for example. When I say that those people, let's call them right-wing libertarians or neoliberals, when I say perhaps if, 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 if the core of their, what they are defending is actually a certain property arrangement, let's call them proprietarians, then people might think I do that in order to take the flags of freedom out of capitalist hands, which is actually one of my intentions. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, I see that as one possible outcome of that kind of uh, change in terms of the debate. But I still defend that, the, academically speaking, the main motive, the main importance, the main measuring stick for whether we should start calling them proprietarians or, or not is analytical, whether, whether it makes analytically more sense. And second, some of the people that are classified as sort of right libertarians or something actually themselves like to call themselves proprietarians. So, so it's not so clear 
that that's only making a pejorative uh, kind of uh, trying to use a pejorative term <coughs> to describe people. Most people would probably assume I don't like I, that. I would like to uh, sort of downgrade their position in defining terms of the debate. And, and, and so that is also true. Then when I discuss with uh, some friends uh, who are critical of those groups of people and, and, and saying like, I can understand why people who want to defend the legitimacy of, of certain property arrangements uh, uh, would like to camouflage this defense by using the nice word liberty and liberty derived terminology there. But I have difficulties in understanding why people who claim to uh, be critical of those kinds of property arrangements would decide to use that kind of language, especially since I think it's analytically flawed. So, so, so I have these kinds of questions where, where uh, Finally, uh, then, then the question about what's the political impact or, or, or social impact of that kind of operation of using, uh, uh, changing terms of the debate or making interventions in the debate with, with uh, sort of terminological questions and whether it actually is advantageous to certain social group or another social group, I'm often like, I don't really care. I mean, I can see these political uh, implications of different terminological choices, but does it benefit a uh, 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 social force that I might be assumed to support, or does it not? Uh, in s on some deep level, I don't care. So, so, so it's it's a complicated it's a complicated kind of uh, relationship between why to write and why to. Uh, uh, why to uh, make, for example, terminological interventions in this conversation that I think academia and, and more generally sort of uh, social life that uses terms that academia uses is. So then to, to add perhaps another, uh, another level on some more general, a little bit slightly more abstract questions than this particular thing about uh, proprietarians or libertarians or neoliberals um, about democracy and democratic norms. I uh, tend to, I mean, I, I, I think democracy, democratic norms in some sense are quite close to academic norms in, 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 in some sense we could have a deeper discussion on that. Uh, I, I don't intend to go there. But, um, but I do think uh, politicization as a political scientist or world politics person, um, scholar, um, I of course by definition deal with political issues. But I think politicization is a very interesting thing that I, I, I see as uh, an important issue. Also because I think without politicization there couldn't be democratization. There can be some sort of, if we assume there's a democratic order, then it doesn't have to be politicized all the time if we assume democratic order something. But in order to change something towards a more democratic order, you need to politicize. For example, feminist politicization of patriarchal family by claiming that the personal is political was one example. And I'm often trying to explore analogy between that move and, uh, and, 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 and the analogy with saying capitalist economy is political and to what extent those who make the claim that capitalist economy is political could learn from the feminist claim personal is political and how that's related to, to, to politicization and opening new spaces for democratic conversation. Because without that kind of politicization, depoliticization is anti-democratic in or anti democratic transformations. It can be useful sometimes to have rules, constitutionalized rules that are not politicized all the time, but in order to have democratic changes, you need politicization. And therefore making uh, terminological interventions, conceptual in interventions in academic conversation, if they uh, somehow uh, question status of certain terms in academic discourse, 
by definition, they politicize those terms. And by definition, in my understanding, they therefore open possibilities for more democratic participation, both within academia about the meaning of those terms and more generally open more democratic spaces in, 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 in the society. So in that sense, I see uh, sort of politicizing terminological interventions as being, broadly speaking, good for the possibility of democratic transformations. Whether democratic transformations are good, then is in, uh, another question, right? But, but uh, so in that sense, I see the connection, one of the connections between uh, participating in academic conversation in, in the terms of the debate and changing the world, but the, the relationship is not as direct as people often assume. Perhaps as a personal note, I often, very often realize, because I tend to think when I intervene in, in uh, whether it's through academic writing or whether through, I don't know, media or social media or something, that people think, oh, there's the professor who, who proposes and opin uh, has many opinions about And I'm like, what opinion did I have? I just asked questions. Like people, a couple of things, like for example, on Catalonia, I've been commenting quite a lot on Catalonia and I hosted Carles Puigdemont here in, 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 at the University of Helsinki. I don't have any position on whether Catalonia should be independent, but so many people, ah, you, because, and I'm like, this is crazy. Show me one place where I, okay, I want to bring certain things to a debate. Or is the Finnish company UPM, is it good or bad that they are doing things in Uruguay, building the world's biggest pulp factory there? I don't have a position on that, um, but so many people think, oh, you, you sort of um, uh, making Finnish companies seem bad in the world by, you know, shouting against uh, the company's presence there. And, uh, and I'm like, show me one piece of my speech or writing where I've done something like that and people can never show it, but still the idea of me doing these things and having all these opinions all the time is there. So I get uh, more amused and frustrated with that, but it's something I, I, I seemingly have to live with. Can I say something? Absolutely, please. Um, I just want to say that I think this, this uh, you've kind of posed this, um, the, the sort of two tasks of clarifying analytical terms and changing the world as something different. But it seems to me that clarifying analytical terms is about changing the world and, and can and often does, and that's kind of why we do it, precisely in the way that um, you know, the feminists have done uh, and, 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 and others are doing. So I, I, I think it's fantastic what you're doing. And, but I think that it's not apolitical, and you, I don't mm. think so either, mm. uh, to clarify analytical terms. But I think that, in fact, that's one of the things that we can very productively do um, is to clarify or bring into question um, concepts that are taken for granted. So I wanted to say that. Thanks. Um, if I was to summarize how I read these in terms of the questions that I posed, um, both of you, um, I guess, Jane, you emphasized a bit more the passion that you have and the desire to communicate. And then Dave, you also, evidently the passion is very strong, but there's also the very strong presence, uh, a, a tangible sense of there being a, a community, an audience, a set of issues in the real world and having the need to make interventions there. And uh, I guess if I were to interpret how you suffer, it's in a way the, the creative tension, which is that something is not clear and you have a nagging need to clarify it and, and work through it. And if I were to take some liberty further to interpreting how you get over it, I think both of you are talking about the process of actually doing it, of writing and thinking. And I think what I take from both of your interventions is that writing is not by any means, solely the, the actual concrete process of typing things on a piece of paper. It is much bigger. It is a process of reflecting on something. It is a process of trying to bring 
things that are partially, not quite unconscious, I would say, but not verbal yet. Mm -hmm. They exist in a different part of your perception, working through them, visualizing them, feeling them, and slowly, slowly letting them mull, mull and cook and ripen. And then eventually, they will acquire some form and shape as text on paper. And I think this is really important in the sense of us getting a sense of the dynamic process. And really quickly, I want to just, because I said, this is for you, so that you can also reflect on what your writing process is about, what kind of difficulties you may encounter, and how you might find ways to go around them. With that idea in mind, I want to give you just a third approach, which is kind of how my writing process appears to me. So why do I write? How do I suffer and how do I get over it? For me, um, the question actually is really difficult and weird to pose, even though I posed it, because um, I have no choice. <coughs> I have no choice but to write. For me, writing is one part of, for me, being alive. It's one part about living, and in that way, it's almost as inseparable from my being than breathing. And it has taken me a really long time, and I still struggle with it because I hope that things were different. I honestly often hope that I was different as a person. I, I, I really wish there was a long time when I wish that I could be easier or simpler and see the world in more clearly defined terms and boxes because the talents that I undoubtedly have would be much more easy to take to some practical use. I don't know if, in, if any of you can relate to it, but I want to emphasize this point because for me, I really have no choice. And the way that I do research is almost a process of osmosis. I'm an anthropologist because that is the way in which I experience the world. And for me, the day that I realized that, in fact, there was something called anthropology which made my way of seeing the world make sense was a moment almost of, of kind of coming into to a religious experience. And for me, I go through life and I experience things, and often I don't really know what I observe. And they start nagging me. And they are in some weird part of my, I'm not even sure if it's a brain. It's a part of a nagging sense of something. And then, if it annoys me enough, I will start working with it. And I have no choice. Otherwise, I wake up in the middle of the night, and I still sometimes do. But they just nag me, and I have to start processing them. And then, whether I get funding from this or that, I more or less kind of just study what nags me the most. Sorry. Um, and um, I encourage you to have the same courage to do that, because if you think in terms of the quality, that's when I think the absolutely best work also comes in. So I start working on it. I start reflecting on it. And then I do read other stuff as well by others, but honestly, my problem is that I'm kind of, an, kind of an egoist in that sense, that I kind of start with my own obsession, with my own thoughts. I can't help it. For me, that's the most interesting thing. And that, in a way, I guess is the sculpting. And then, mm -hmm. and I suffer. And um, the Finnish composer, director Leif Segerstam, once said that for him, he composes a lot. Composing is kind of, his compositions are like sperm. There's a lot of them, and there needs to be a lot of them. And he doesn't know which ones of them catch on and they, they acquire life. But they need to be out there. And it was really shocking when I realized that, oh my god, for me, writing and doing things is kind of like that. And of course, I'm a woman, so I'm not supposed to have sperm. I'm supposed to have something else. But I just realized that, for me, there, I have no choice. I feel like I have a Tourette syndrome. I write academic texts. I write tweets. Go and check my tweets from this session. I do Facebook posts. I do Instagram. I just have a need to say these things because they come out. And then some of them are going to be the ones that I work on in terms of them becoming serious papers, and I suffer. And I have two children, and some of you who have gone through labor, for me, it's, the process is identical. You carry them through you, and it's sometimes so annoying. Every move you make aches, and you want to get rid of these things that are carrying themselves in you. And uh, then they still take their time, and they insist on ripening in you. And uh, then the moment of painful delivery, which in my case with the first one, I mean, it took so long, and with the second one, it's painful. So I suffer. It's actually like going through labor. And I think. In a way, it helps when you think about producing something in those terms, because that's also how important it is to produce something and how valuable it is. And how do I get over it? I had to say that fortunately, I, in my case, the second childbirth was easier than the first one. So I like to think that experience helps a little bit. You, when you start to get in real pain, you can sometimes, I think, with experience, look back on that and say, OK, I know kind of what this is about. And sometimes you don't realize that these are, in fact, the birthing pains 
Then a little while goes by and you start to realize, okay, I've dealt with this before. Okay, it's time for me to give myself a break. I always buy licorice, I buy um, chewing gum. Uh, sometimes I eat chocolate, I have to have very specific kinds of sweets. Then I need to think, okay, I need to give myself a break here to take it easy. I have to go through is this, and then I have to be a prima donna, and I'm like, I'm in my deep bubble, and then my family is really happy about that, and what can I do? I have to go through delivery. And then what really makes it easier is once you do endure through the pain, and having the product out there, I don't know how you can feel about that, it's often it can be an anti-climax because the sense of fulfillment is oh, not so as depression. great <laughs> precisely. I'm kind of like, oh my God, that thing sucks. I don't want to see it. I'm so embarrassed and mortified by the fact that that's what I ended up with. But then when a little time goes by, you start to appreciate what you have produced. And one of the things I want to emphasize, I think we have to give ourselves a break. It's not only in terms of the brilliance of our thought, where the value of our creative work lies. It's also in the actual concrete hard work. And that is in part for me what I want to celebrate with a session such as this, so that you learn to appreciate the hard work that goes into these creations. Maybe this is the time now, unless we have managed to intimidate you to <laughs> shut up entirely. Please, um, one hand, think about more hands, so Suvi, Please. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, so let's see um, who who wants to respond if we even get through them. So, um, kind of adding on to what Mia was saying with the second labor, um, Jane just now answering the question to suffering. You were talking about past tense, so you returned to your um, dissertation, but you're currently writing. So, is there still suffering? Does it get easier for you, <laughs> as as Mia just <laughs> suggested? And um, also, th I really enjoyed. Um, um, your comments about um, writing through questions or productive puzzlement, as you called it. Um, to the questions, are you constantly conscious of the questions? Do you, for example, um, materialize it somewhere? Do you write it somewhere and have it there? Or is it something that's constantly evolving um, that you return to for at the maybe at the very beginning and then at the again at the very end? Or I'm just kind of interested in the, in the production of these questions. Are, how conscious are you? Uh, how con sorry, how conscious are you of them? And then um, Davos' um, presentation, thank you for that. Um, and then adding on just now with the comments, you kind of, um, I don't know if this, if I can form this as a question, but you seem to suggest in your presentation that um, writing for academic um, audiences and or for academia and for um, kind of popular culture or for the public um, are similar, um, but my Personally, my biggest um, challenge is the audiences of the public. So because, especially in the past four years, I've been so um, entrenched in um, academic conversations, I can't even talk, you know, in, in a, even like a dinner conversation. It often leads to just frustration. And the other day, my friend just said, stop asking so many questions to this person. They obviously haven't read what you've read. You know, I was kind of becoming a, a accusing them of, of or rather than my questions seemed like they were accusing, but I was just trying to form a conversation. Um, so I can't even consider writing to the public because um, my language, I feel like my language, I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, and again, maybe th maybe, is it about just reading uh, media as much as possible and knowing who the audience is, is or how do you kind of come across that? Thank you. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for these great questions. Um, yeah, I, I'm still suffering. I'm still suffering with this book, uh, which is a different sort of thing uh, where I, I'm writing a book in which I'm pulling together work that has, you know, sort of draft chapters, papers, think pieces, some of which have been published, quite a lot of it hasn't been published, and trying to figure out how I'm going to make it into a coherent book. So in a way, I have a number of the pieces, but uh, they have to be kind of rewritten and really rethought uh, in terms of how they hang together to make a book. So it's a, a slightly different uh, project, a kind of maybe mechanical project, it, it, although it's not mechanical in any, <laughs> in any way. Uh, but I think it, th there is there's always an anxiety I associated with writing, am I going to find that, you know, that thread? I, or, or will it just kind of remain unfinished and unwieldy, unwieldy and unfinished? 
um, and probably I will have to make uh, some decisions so that it actually comes out because I've been promising it for so long to so many people. Um, so that kind of kind of le leads into your question about the questions, and and I and I have emphasized that uh, that questions are important in my writing, al although I kind of hadn't realized that, and also and I think that's a good description also of the fact that th it takes. A I might have a kind of question which is more like a nagging thing that Mia is talking about. Something, something bugs me or something's really interesting but I can't quite figure out what it is that I want to say about it or what question that it poses for me. So I think the question may take a long time to emerge it, with the kind of clarity which, which it has by the end. And I think that w when I do my kind of final editing of articles, let's say, that's the point at which I demand of myself, okay, what is it, either what is my question or what am I trying to say here? And make sure that it's extremely crystal clear uh, to the reader through, through you know, processes of editing, really, uh, uh, self-editing. And in, in that case, I have to say that um, I, perhaps go from complicated, complex, to more simple in my writing process. And I think your, your example of Gayatri Spivak uh, is very, very interesting that she writes in this terribly convoluted and complex way that we all struggle with. But when you hear her speak, it can often be much clearer. And that's al actually why I like to go to interviews, published or video interviews with scholars and academics. You know, if you listen to Foucault, or, or Pierre Bourdieu, have I heard him in an interview? I'm not sure, but certainly I've heard F Foucault, I've, I've watched, uh, and, and, and other people, Nancy Fraser. I mean, just m many people that I uh, admire and I want to understand their thought better. Sometimes it's much more vivid uh, uh, when they speak. And so I think I try to aspire to that a bit um, when, I, when I write, that it will be something that my mother or my sister could read and get the basic idea of what I wanted to say and understand why I was excited about it. Thanks, Deva. So this uh, question about asking questions and also the public as an audience, a more specialized academic audience. So um, perhaps on the latter one, um, the of course they're different. I'm, I'm by no means claiming, I think there's room and need for that kind of academic conversation that the general public cannot understand. I, mean, I think it's clear. And, and, and there are different fields, different research teams, different topics. I perhaps happen to work on topics where there's more flow between conversations in sort of general media and academic conversation, which might in somewhat unfair way mean that, uh, for example, I might, the media might sometimes uh, talk to me more because my topics are of certain kind and the language and the concepts are something where there's more flow between media, whereas there are other topics that may seem very difficult because there's less conversion and less convergence between the academic conversation and the sort of general conversation in the media. So uh, I guess it kind of depends on, on different fields how, how that goes. And there's no need, uh, I think, for... I think the uh, we will have... Uh, I think Sari and Sami here speaking, um, who were directing this place before, and, and, and they, as far as I remember, have this thing like it's it's one should. There's no need to interact with you know to make your research publicly, sort of uh, so sexy media sexy or or something. Uh, this thing uh, that you mentioned about asking questions and being seen as, as annoying and, and something sometimes I 
I feel uh, uh, for uh, if you ask sort of provocative questions or criticize some position or ask questions that question some position for a more authoritarian mind, this may sometimes seem the response might be like, hey, why are you trying to negate my right to, to, to exist or have my <coughs> position? Whereas for a more democratic mind, that's a start of, that's an invitation to a conversation. That's very clear in responses, both, especially in, in, in general debates, in Twitter yeah. And, yeah. and somewhere, this difference, and, 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 and perhaps also in academia. So it's, um, but this is simplifying it a little bit. But I think there's, 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 and, and whether in Finnish, whether Finnish academic and general public conversation is different from, I don't know, Spanish. For example, where it's you know in a dinner table, you know uh, people may seem you know you or in I've spent a lot of time in Latin America, so, uh, so, so sort of it seems like you're shouting to each other and you like being rude and <laughs> and and sort of I intervening and interrupting and oh yeah we want and 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 I love that I like that and I think it's like invitation when somebody's very provocatively interrupting you and saying you're completely wrong with her I'm like yeah this is a nice invitation to a conversation but some other people might think you know this asshole is trying to suffocate my right of existence or my freedom of speech so it's a question of style a little bit and there might be differences between national and other cultures in that. Thanks. Um, yes, please. <laughs> I don't know if you can take the mic. Okay, I'll repeat the question, so please go ahead. Uh, Thanks, that's an excellent question. Uh, just to, to repeat, uh, kind of summarizing, so the differences between different genres of writing, particularly journalistic writing and academic writing, and uh, a certain blockage that may exist beyond or between the big ideas and then getting the actual words down on paper. Um. So I'm trying to think of the author, but I can't remember it at the moment. But there was there's a there's a sociologist called Gary something American, and he's a wonderful wonderful writer, and he talked about the process of writing the doctoral dissertation uh, and being terrorized by the literature, and I think that's what you're referring to, I in that shift from academic write from journalistic to academic writing. I think I actually feel that there shouldn't be such a big gap between, that good academic writing ought to be closer to journalistic, good journalistic writing, good analytical, like our best journalists. Um, to me, the, the genre that they write in, which is very, very kind of powerfully, historically informed, very analytical, very sophisticated, is to me very close to what I think good academic writing should be. So I actually would encourage you not to think that you have to do something massively different. What you do have to do is position yourself within debates if they exist and show that you know 
what they are and, and where you sit or stand in relation to them. Um, and I think actually that's the main thing. So I would actually encourage you not to think that you have to do something massively different uh, because academic writing, you know, we are responsible, uh, you know, we say that we want our uh, academic work to have an impact in the world, to change the world, to uh, help uh, uh, ordinary people, everybody to think critically about concepts or think, of, you know, use concepts in a different way. That's not going to happen unless we, you know, change the way that we write so that educated, ordinary educated readers uh, who are non-specialists can understand it. So I really think that's, um, that we, and, and we need to be part of that change. And obviously people in my generation, the, the more senior people, uh, are, are, have much more responsibility to make sure that journal articles and books get published using that kind of language. Um, that's what I would say. Thank you. Tevo. I guess I'm mostly simply agree with what Jane said and uh, I think my position on the similarities between journalism and academic writing is, is very close to what you said and so I was referring to before so sometimes it's I was thinking like this something I was going to comment uh, was what some people recommend at that it at the sort of getting beyond some sort of blockage or, or getting started or something <laughs> is, for some people it's okay, you just decide that you assume that, okay, now I'm a scholar. And whether, whether it, uh, yeah, and it's not incompatible with what Jane said. I mean, it can be, I'm, I've been, I'm a journalist, that's my identity, and I want to write as a scholar. So, okay, now I'm assuming the role of a scholar, which could be actually very similar to being a journalist, but still uh, making that kind of um, internal, uh, sort of internal in some sense step like just assume it some say it helps and some say you know that's one in some sort of writing uh, guidebooks and something it's it's often mentioned but yes about the how to participate in the conversation something about because we could speak much more about techniques of writing in some sense and one thing that's fascinated me, and I don't have total clarity on that, is how to use footnotes and how much stuff you put in footnotes. Because, and also footnotes as something, of course, there are many new kinds of software also for, for the process of writing, but assuming the traditional kind of ones we use, sometimes footnotes are very good for, in the process of writing, moving things to a footnote and then to the main text and moving them in between and then defining what stays in the footnote and what is in the text. I'm, I sometimes there are like, you know, people who write like the actual, the normal text is like this and then the footnote can be three quarters of the page or something. And uh, I sometimes admire that kind of boldness <laughs> about footnotes. Um, but that's about techniques of writing in some sense. Thanks, and with that, I'm actually really happy to say that this session is over for the simple reason that I don't know about you. I actually think that if <coughs> I were to ask now for more questions, more hands would come up. I know personally that I have so much more that I would love to say. And with this, I feel like we have accomplished what we sought to accomplish with the first session, which is to get the discussion going. I think we have already touched upon a number of themes that will come up in the small groups. And as you know, I don't know if you know yet in which small group you are in, some of you will have the extraordinary privilege to work with Jane in the coming days, and the rest of you are gonna be incredibly fortunate and privileged to work with the other wonderful um, conveners that we have. And uh, I know that, Devo, you are gonna be sticking around for lunch, right? And possibly even for reception, wine, is that a tempting enough offer for you? <laughs> Yeah, tempting, some nibble? Sure. Tempting, yes. okay. Yeah. So anybody who wants to convene with uh, Devo over, over drinks tonight, make sure that you get him appropriately excited so that he will be back here at four o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> now, let's enjoy some nourishment for the body after we have gotten this nourishment for the mind. And we continue after the lunch. And thank you so much, Jane and Devo. This was a fantastic start for this working. <laughs> <laughs>